So, thank you for being here. Everyone says, is this your first trip to Puerto Rico? And I say, no, it's my 20th. I happen to have a lot of investors from Puerto Rico, which is really unusual, but um, it was serendipitous. Um, so, Carlos said they saved the best for last. This is, this is the last, so better be the best. Um, one thing you should know is that I don't spell my name with an A in the middle of it. So if you're trying to contact me, Twitter, Jeff Diamond, Google, I mean Gmail, Jeff Diamond at gmail.com, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to jump right into it because I've got 105 slides to go through in about 30 minutes. And I'm being serious. I've done this before. It's a lot of fun. We'll just blow through it. Two sides to this presentation. One is the entrepreneurial side. This clock is wrong. It says 19 minutes. I, they gave me 45. Um, and so we talk about the entrepreneurial side, and we're going to talk about the investor side a little bit. So first, how do you get an entrepreneur to do the impossible? Does anyone know? You simply ask them a question, or you make a statement. You say, dude, you're never going to be able to do that, ever. So a little background, my CV. I started a number of companies. I've been also an investor in 70 direct companies as well as limited partnerships. I used to be the chief investment officer for a very large family office with about $400 million under management. It was all alternatives, all direct investments, all limited partnerships, real estate, et cetera, et cetera. I funded five startups, um, started three of them from my living room, Fencast, Bump.com, and Fitmoo is my third. These other companies I did start in my spare time, CRS, Echo Invest, and I have the tech rights to a couple other companies as well. I've advised a number of companies from an early stage all the way through their growth. I've been an operator of numerous businesses that are not technology related, and I have been on the board of directors of UCSD, University of California, San Diego, their, um, their School of Entrepreneurship, which we funded with about $25 million grant. Um, in terms of my CV and, and some, some successes I've had, I've got two businesses that are still operating that I started and funded. I sold one to Instanet. We have, I was the chief, chief executive officer of a large multifamily office called uh, Genspring, or chief executive officer of the private equity group, which is a really odd title. And I was the chief investment officer, as I said, of a large uh, single family office. I also founded the first venture capital broadcasting, I'm sorry, venture capital distribution business at Merrill Lynch. And Kleiner Perkins was my first client. It's the lesson that you just go do something. I got in a lot of trouble by bringing Kleiner Perkins back to the company. But at the end of the day, they provided a lot of fees, so everything was forgiven. On the personal side, I was the uh, a finalist in the Harvard Business School Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 2001. That dates me, I know. And I've been an Ironman triathlete. I've kiteboarded all around the world, et cetera. If you, one lesson is if you are an entrepreneur and you really want to get the attention of some very influential pe people, just learn to kiteboard. And right out here is one of the most difficult places you'll ever learn to kiteboard. These are a couple of the logos of my companies, Vencast, Events.com, and Fitmoo. Um, Fitmoo is the one that um, I'll talk briefly about only because it's a lesson that I want to tell you about. Um, some of the fun things we get to do as entrepreneurs is we get to go hang out with other entrepreneurs, and, and uh, they're much more successful than we are. This is Richard Branson on Necker Island, and that's him kiting in the background, and that's me, which is a lot of fun, and then he took off on his helicopter and went somewhere. Um, but the less fun part of being an entrepreneur is this. Four hours a day commuting to New York City. That's my desk. That's a blow-up bed that I would typically use. I would lay it down, and I could not lay it down in my office because there was no room. My office was so small. So I would bring that into the developer room, and I would go to sleep for four or five hours and come back out. I got a lot of comments on that. So Fitmoo is interesting. Fitmoo is the, one of the first companies that I, I started it's, it's defining a whole new genre, and the new genre is, is, is social distribution. Social distribution is effectively taking a product and being able to distribute it through every single person's network of friends and family and, and uh, customers and fans and followers. And so it, it is able to touch hundreds of thousands of touch points and able to get distribution that way. And the reward system is either dollar-based or it's point-based or it's some sort of reward associated with that. Fitmu is that, and we built that agnostic technology to underpin an entire industry movement. Um, this is how it works. You have a product up here. You have a product that's endorsed by an influencer. An influencer could be somebody on Instagram. An influencer is one of you. And it effectively gets distributed out to your network. 
It's a next generation multi-level marketing business, next generation affiliate network, really easy to use. You're gonna be able to take products from around the web and bring them into your network and get remunerated for that. That's the next generation of distribution. Everybody's looking for distribution. Everybody's looking to sell excess capacity. Excess capacity is like a thorn in our foot and we're desperate to do it. So I'm not gonna show you this video. Um, I am gonna go back, can I go back? There was, you know, I'll, sh I'll show you this video. Let's go back. This is our app. We have an entire desktop that has a lot of dashboards and everything else. This is our, remember, this is for the fitness industry, but it can be applied to music, it can be applied to entertainment, it can be applied to food and fashion and lifestyle, it can be applied to travel, it can be applied to any industry. The technology itself is the agnostic piece of three million lines of code. It can be licensed, white labeled, or purchased by other large industry participants. It's what Facebook has been trying to do. It's Twitter. It's it's uh, they're all adding the buy button. Pinterest. This is allows you to not only socialize what you love and buy what you love, but it allows you to sell what you love simply by socializing. A very very important distinction. Nobody wants to be a seller these days. The minute you become a seller to your friends, you no longer have friends. So this is pretty cool. Um, a lot of downloads, all of that good stuff. Um, just two days ago, Christmas Abbott, who you saw, who's all tatted up, who's got those really cool, sexy gun things. Um, she put a calendar on here. She, she designed her own calendar and she put it on here. And she sold 75 units of it first two hours of her putting it up. And some of those sold from her fans and followers. We're giving people the ability to monetize their networks after they socialize it. Fitness just happens to be a starting point. It's a really interesting starting point because it's a massive industry with hundreds of thousands of participants and merchants and influencers and event managers. So these are all specific to the fitness industry. I'm gonna quickly, I'm gonna whip over this because we don't have much time. So an entrepreneur, what is an entrepreneur? An entrepreneur to me is nothing but an investor in their own business. Very, very similar, not dissimilar from a venture capitalist who is also an entrepreneur. The big difference is you've got two sets of resources. In one case, you've got a resource of time. In the other case, you've got a resource of money. They're both investing in private companies. So both are effectively entrepreneurs because they're both investing their commodity or their resource that they have in one particular company. One's investing dollars, the other one's investing time. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what defines success and failure. Success and failure is defined by many people in many different ways. In fact, everybody here has a different definition of success and failure. Nick, from one of these startup, uh, one of these venture funds in New York, he defines it like this, a path to success for startups. The great is there's a great product idea, there's a deep understanding of the market, there's a competitive environment that's benign, there's a business fundamentals that are strong, and I am so fucking bored with this that I, it literally, it's a competition as to how fast I can fall asleep reading this versus two Ambien and a glass of wine. So this is pulled right out of a Peter Drucker book. It's not new age, it has nothing to do, it's not innovative, it doesn't do anything to me. What is an entrepreneur? Is an entrepreneur a business owner, a deli owner, a CEO of a technology company? What about the second or third or fifth or 500th employee? Are they an entrepreneur too because they're taking the risk? Um, a DJ, a musician, we got a lot of those around here. Are they an entrepreneur? A pro athlete, they're managing their own brand outside of their sport. They're entrepreneurs too because they've got a lifespan of four years or five years. John Doerr defines an entrepreneur and a successful one as somebody who used to start a new business, but today they're defining new business models. It's no longer just, so think of one thing, one thing that defines the word entrepreneur for you or successful entrepreneur. I wrote down risk taker, calculated risk taker, somebody that's living in extreme poverty, uh, a business purchaser, a small business owner, new division within a large business. They sold their company, they solve problems, they're job creator, they're savants, they're introverts. I'm a big time introvert. What was I doing before this? I was probably spending four hours by myself. Not networking. It doesn't, you know, it's one of my characteristics. So, works at a coffee shop. They're all entrepreneurs that have their, their, their things out. Bill Gross, Idealabs, founder, one of the most successful incubators in history. 
he did a big study. You can find this on TED. I'd highly recommend to listen to it. And he basically studied hundreds and hundreds of companies that came through his incubator and ones that he studied outside of his incubator as well. He took a number of companies public. He's got a resume that is you know, 200 times mine and ours com combined. And he also merged a lot of companies. He basically boiled it down to five elements of success. The ideas, the team, the business model, the funding, the timing. And then he weighted them after a lot of interviews and, and many, many months of studying this. And he found that from Airbnb to Instagram and Uber, these are the ones that did not come through his incubator. And looking at the successful and the not so successful ones in his incubator, the, the top five factors of success were timing was number one. I didn't see Nick talk about timing. I didn't see him talk about necessarily the team. I didn't see him talk about, well, he talked about the idea. The timing was number one. It's timing luck. It's timing really studying the market. My first startup, Vencast, that you guys saw, 15 years ahead of its time, true story, I had somebody in my office less than a year ago pitching me my company that started 15 years ago. It was amazing. Who's the smarter one? Is it the guy that just got Draper Fisher to back his startup with $5 million? Or is it me that raised $20 million with my first startup and I educated FINRA on how to police and manage this entire new industry? I think it might have been the guy that came in with $5 million, although he was a complete moron. Um, and it, it didn't work out anyway. So who's right? Is Bill right or is Nick right? What about Mark Andreessen? Mark Andreessen, his core characteristic to define success in a startup and an innovator is, is somebody who's a product innovator and entrepreneur, but somebody that never gives up. And Eric Reyes talks on, in the Lean Startup about somebody that operates in extreme, a contest of, of extreme uncertainty. But never give up, that's Mark Andreessen. Mark Andreessen says never give up. That's the one core attribute he looks for. But then you look at Seth Gooden, who's, who's, uh, or Godden, who's ever read this book. It's a great little book. It's an easy read. It takes a day. And he says, absolutely not. The core characteristic of somebody who's successful as an entrepreneur is somebody that gives up often and gives up early and quits successfully. Quitting successfully is the core attribute of an entrepreneur. And then he talks about the dip and leaning into the dip and a bunch of other stuff. So is it quitters or is it not quitters? I actually don't define it as quitters or not quitters. I define it as somebody who's a little bit narcissistic, but also is completely ignorant to the, ro to the, the roadblocks ahead of you. So blissful ignorance and narcissism are the two core characteristics that I look for in companies that I invest in. So going back, an entrepreneur is an investor in their own business, while a venture capitalist is also an entrepreneur. We're going to give you a little story, Dan Wensley. Dan Wensley started a company called MeMap. MeMap was able to draw on your mobile device a little friend circle around a particular map. Anytime a friend came into the map, and to your section, you get notified that that friend has entered your section. The business model was quite interesting. It was um, allowed for Starbucks and instant couponing any time a friend came in. Kind of cool. He got 1,500,000 downloads. He was offered $100 million from Google with a $20 million, $25 million earnout after three months of operating. And he turned it down. And instead, he raised $19.5 million from Kleiner Perkins at a $25 million valuation, far less than the 125. So he went on, and that would have been, he had had $2.5 million invested, $125 million. It would have been a 19,600% return and a 25x for him, and he would have done extraordinarily well. So I'm going to talk quickly about the difference or the correlation between time, which is holding period, and an internal rate of return. So this is a little video I did on the relationship between time and internal rate of return. One night I got really crazy and I learned Final Cut Pro, downloaded a free copy of it and built this video. It just so happens I'd been in front of a green screen the night, the day before and done it. And, and so I just learned editing and put this thing together because I'm really, really interested in this. So it's fascinating to me. Many people know that time is inversely correlated with internal rate return, That's me but suit. very few people understand the significance of that negative correlation. Let me give you some simple examples of why it's meaningful to you and your portfolio of private equity. Adjusting the holding period might be the most effective IRR generating strategy that you engage in, besides not chasing bad money with good money, or chasing the losers. 
Example one, very simple math, $100 invested today, after five years, $300 return. That's a 25% internal rate of return. The same $100 returned in one year generate a 200% return. That's a remarkable difference in the ability to generate internal rate of return and reuse that capital in year two, three, four, five, six. Another way of looking at this is, again, simple math, but units of time. You'll see that the return drops by 40%, by 40% by adding one unit of time when you move from two units to three units of time. The return drops by 63% when you move from one unit to two units. So effects are greater the shorter the time period. Again, decreasing the holding period from five units of time to four units of time adds an additional 29% return. And decreasing the holding period from three units to two units adds an additional 66% return. The return drops in this example 78% by adding two units of time. Looking at this a third way, again, relatively simple math. A 21% return over one year is about a 1.21x. Okay, simple math. The same $100 invested on a 21% return is going to generate a 2.59 times cash on cash return. One would say that looking at the comparison, it's not that bad to just have to double the 1.21x to get to the 2.59x. But the reality is, the difference there is very significant. It's actually close to eight times a difference in cash on cash return once you subtract out the cost basis. So if you subtract out the cost basis, you're comparing 0.21x to 159x or 1.59x, a difference of 7.59 times. The lesson here is that if you're confident that you can generate from years two, three, four, and five an 8x from where you are at the end of year one, then stay with the investment to generate that 21% return. If you're not confident that you can do an 8x from that point forward, try to reduce the holding period. So why is this all relevant? It's relevant because time degrades your IRR more than anything else. And if you focus like a laser on decreasing your holding periods of your private equity portfolio, your comp comparable returns are going to go way up. Our group specializes in early liquidity for both funds and direct investments in private companies. And we can definitely help you with this. Contact us for a free, complete Okay, so you never want to work for me because you're getting emails at 3 in the morning talking about units of time. Um, thank you very much for playing that. Um, so going back to the presentation, we now see the correlation between holding period and units of time. And the challenge is that private equity and venture capital isn't that liquid. But it actually is. I've sold dozens of positions in the secondary market. I have monetized positions in other ways that have taken a long time to do, but I've generated about $25 million of excess return for people I've worked for, for very wealthy individuals and investors, by managing the holding period. Okay? And so forget the ultimate outcome of that particular investment. Managing the holding period, I've generated an additional $25 million of return. So going back to our little example here with, uh, with this, I'm just having trouble clicking on this. The next slide. The, so Dan Wensley doesn't exist, but that company does exist. And it was a little play there. This is David Morin. David Morin started a company called Path. Path was offered $125 million from Google. Path was a company that turned that down and ended up raising $77 million over its lifespan. It, raised, it started with a $2.5 million, it turned down the Google offer, and then went on to raise a lot more money from Kleiner Perkins and other venture investors. If you notice, those two together came out to that 19.7. So PATH, if anybody is familiar with PATH or remembers the story about PATH, it was an ad-free social network. It was anti-Facebook and it had a limited number of friends based on the principle that all of us only have a small number of friends. They ended up getting 23 million registered users and they were on the path to success. No pun intended, actually pun intended. Um, until this little problem, until they hit a little road bump. And the road bump was that people, Path was stealing 
your contacts from your phone and dumping them on their servers. And then they use the excuse that they said, whoops, uploads your, I, I, your address book to their servers. Imagine a hacker's paradise is getting access to their server with all your contacts. Um, we don't want to connect you with just anyone on PATH. We want you to connect with people that you already know. That was their excuse. So their monthly active users started to drop precipitously, right? And they raised $77 million. Uh, the users, 23 million users. Their cost of acquisition was $3, and the revenue was zero. And they ended up selling recently, last year, to a Korean company for $25 million. This is the return. This is the return that the investors got. The 2.5 million got wiped out, and everybody up until the last investor got wiped out because of the one times waterfall that was in their documents. Goes to show, getting in early does not necessarily mean that you're going to get the highest return. In this case, the early investors got wiped out. Kleiner Perkins, I'm going to turn the conversation a little bit over to um, well, I'm, uh, the, the, the fun side of things. Kleiner Perkins sees 2,500 business plans a year. Everybody knows who Kleiner Perkins is. They meet with 100 groups and they fund 25 of them. Andreessen Horowitz has the same type of ratio where they see 4,000 tech startups a year and they fund 20. Uh, there's statistics out there that only 200 startups in the technology space actually get venture funding. 200 a year. Okay, those numbers aren't as large as you guys read about all the time because there are a number of deals that aren't, quote, tech startups. And they aren't startups and they aren't technology companies. So if you read through these research reports and whatnot, you'll see some really odd numbers. Three companies in Kleiner Perkins, each fund that they have, forget the year, each fund that they have, three companies result in 95% of the return that Kleiner will generate for, for that fund for their limited partners. Three. So I'm like, shit, as an investor now, do I pick Kleiner? Do I pick the vintage year? Do I pick Sequoia and Kleiner? Can I get in? So lessons for entrepreneurs. You guys can't see this. Oh, you can. Ideas are different from businesses. Visionaries are not entrepreneurs. Operators are hired. Emotional attachments are extremely hard to break. You've got to make money from day one. Remember, the title of this presentation is From One. You've got to sell more of them in day two. And this is the most important lesson, which is follow the winners. Follow the companies. Follow the entrepreneurs. Follow the industries. Follow the fund managers. They tend to repeat. The successful ones tend to repeat. The losers six, tend to repeat. Over here, I come up with an idea a day. Swear to God at least an idea today. Ten of it make it to paper. One every two years makes it to a plan. One every five years gets funded. And I have two or three that are usually successful, uh, hopefully successful over the period of my lifetime. Um, so the lessons here, I'm sorry about the formatting. This formatting is cut off. It says lessons from one, one paying customer, one product sale, one download, one car wide, one room rental, one enterprise sale. I met somebody last night that has a band that uh, it's a net, you know, for kids, never get lost. And he sold three of them. And I was high-fiving the guy. He sold three bands. You know, that's the start of something. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. Once you get, sell one, once you give one away, once, once somebody adopts it, scale it, fund it, and, of course, sell it. So oftentimes I'm asked, what's next? Um, what's next on Jeff Diamond's horizon? What's next in, in uh, general trends in the venture community? Uh, liquidity is the new gold. Secondary market will be bigger than the primary. Valuation adjustments have already started. More and more companies will remain private longer and longer. Limited partners, investors, entrepreneurs better buckle up for a two times holding period. Business models, freemium model, Strava's great, SaaS is great, uh, recurring revenues, class pass, efficiency Canva, email, web apps, and consolidator organizers. Um, I, 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 hope, I hope this is the right presentation. So this is not a, a, a winner take all marketplace. This is a place where you have music applications that are distributed throughout, the, throughout many industries, many geographies, and many different business models associated with it. And they're all winning. Um, there's a big diff so there's a lot of marketplaces that are not winner-take-all marketplaces. On the app side, I think the next big movement is not in apps at all. I've never been a big fan of apps. I think um, apps are actually very proprietary. Uh, we're going to see, as satellites are launched, and et cetera, et cetera, we're going to see web apps actually take on a much more meaningful part in our, uh, in our lives. And the phone itself will not be app-based. It will be, um, the phone itself is going to be web app-based, so it's going to be based around experiences. My shopping experience, my travel experience, my business experience is all going to be supported by 
the infrastructure companies that want to sell to me and that I actually appreciate were very different from yours and very different from everybody's. Um, biggest ideas. So I'm going to go into, um, this is not the right presentation, but that's fine because um, I'll, 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 I'll get to the other stuff that I want to get to. The biggest idea is in venture, new thinking on venture. Um, I'm going to talk about venture and then the investments. So social distribution is going to be very, very big. Next generation of social distri of distribution, access to the networks and billions of people distributing products and services globally. Everything will eventually be used. Social distribution from cars and houses and restaurants and, and, and reservations and conference tickets. Everything is going to be socially distributed. Um, on the venture side, I think the, uh, there's going to be a new paradigm shift and it's going to be in, um, in compression algorithms. I think we're going to see we have constraints right now with respect to bandwidth and res with respect to pipes. We see fiber optics, we see airwaves getting cluttered, and I think we're going to see a major, major shift in the way the data is being transmitted over short distances and large distances and large packets of data. Uh, we're already seeing major movements in terms of compression algorithms in, um, in, in video and in pictures, but what we're dealing with is we're dealing with a 1949 article by Shannon Entropy that talks about the, uh, the physical constraints in terms of um, transmitting the channel and receiving data. And it has to do with ones and zeros. And there is a big, sh uh, a big movement going on to actually help us deal with the constraints of the system by launching satellites with OneWeb and O3B and SpaceX and a few other companies. They're going to be launching large numbers of satellites into low Earth orbit, which is about 50 miles and they're going to reduce the latency of large packets of data. Um, what they're doing is they're dealing with, uh, they're not changing the status quo, they're dealing with a set of circumstances that have been delivered, and they're not dealing with a fundamental problem in the physics. Um, what I really like about Shannon, Entro uh, Shannon Entropy is he basically defined a movement called information theory, which is the, uh, an intersection of physics and statistics and mathematics and computer science and, um, and electrical engineering, and he said, there are physical limits, we're going to deal with ones and zeros. Well, what if we rethink the whole process and instead of dealing with ones and zeros, we talk about multiple dimensions. We talk about maybe uh, eliminating the status quo and trying to get six gigabytes of data over, over today's bandwidth, today's bandwidth in one second, and all lossless compression versus lossy compression. That would be six billion bytes of, bytes of data, which you have to multiply that times eight to see the number of ones and zeros. So it's a lot of data to be transmitted in one second. And that would be a compression ratio of today's, and today's numbers of about 4,800 to one. Um, what we deal with here is rethinking the status quo and turning it into, instead of two dimensions, which is the Huffman code and the LZ code, uh, or LZW uh, compression, we, and triangles, we look at triangles as pyramids or prisms. And we look at prisms having many, many different attributes and qualities that, uh, that two-dimensional uh, two shapes don't have in terms of being able to um, aggregate and compress code and then ultimately decompress it. And what three, three dimensions does, it allows you to be effectively a worm inside of a shape. You put a couple shapes together and you're talking about vectors. Vectors allow you to be transmitting large quantities of information in three-dimensional shapes, multiple three-dimensional shapes that are touching over short distances, uh, over long distances in the same bandwidth in a much shorter period of time. But then you add a fourth element, you add the element of time, and you add the element of nanoseconds. We have now have processors, and we have bandwidth, and we have the ability to now add bursts of time, bursts of nanoseconds in between zeros and ones with accuracy. And if you do that with accuracy, you're able to effectively have an, uh, an, infinite, an infinite amount of data transmitted at, in, the, in the speed of light simply by introducing a fourth element, which is time. And time is, is a, it, it doesn't exist, right? There's, there's not a, it's not a zero, it's not a one, it just doesn't exist. So it's a, it's a fourth element that doesn't exist. You combine the three dimensions with this fourth dimension called time, and you come up with a new paradigm shift in terms of the way that date, large data can be transmitted. So on the investment side, on the investment side, we're going to see um, a couple things. We're going to see, first of all, a major, major movement in terms of um, the secondary market. Is anybody familiar with the secondary market and limited partnership interests and primary interests? You know, so secondary market is bifurcated into two areas. Secondary market has direct interests that you can buy of Uber and Airbnb and the rest of them if you've got the money and you've got the access. And the secondary market is also unlimited partnership interests. You can buy pieces of funds that are already seasoned. I can buy a 2000 
and eight, a 2008 vintage year of Kleiner Perkins in the market today. We saw that with CalPERS. They just sold $3 billion to Blackstone, and they sold it at par, at par. So what they did is they trusted the GPs, which is, you know, uh, whoever the GPs is. They sold, I, th I think it was 30 managers, LP positions, and they sold those positions based on the marks to market that the GPs had put in there. The marks to market are what's called lower of cost or market. Guys, have you ever read an LP agreement? Again, another great cure for insomnia. Um, you will see lower of cost or market where the GPs have an incentive to market up. Some of them don't um, until they get to a certain period of time. And that's a whole other hour long discussion. But basically, there's a massive amount of secondaries. Let me just put it in perspective for you. Primaries versus secondaries. Um, let me see if I'm going to get into that in a second. I'm going to go back. No. Sorry. So here's, here's, here's the slides that I'm missing, guys. And I promise if anybody emails me, I'm going to send you a presentation with another 20 slides in it. And it's going to talk about the primary market. It's going to talk about the direct market. And it's going to talk about the secondary market. The primary market. I know these numbers because I have this odd way of remembering shit um, that is completely meaningless. So the numbers are this. We had 3,978, I'm sorry, 7,398 deals that were completed last year in 2014, backed by venture capital companies. Those are deals. They're not startups. They're corporate and venture. It doesn't include private equity. These are venture ones. Um, $78 billion was invested in the primary markets by venture capitalists, by corporate venture partners in private companies last year. You cut those numbers in half to about $48 billion that was invested in technology companies. Not startups, but all the way through the curve, right? So you have a lot of data and a lot of companies that are being funded. In the primary market, and in the secondary market, secondary market is massive, massive. $30 billion was raised last year by secondary funds who have an exclusive purpose to buy LP positions. Forget the Drex. They're not interested in the Drex. They're interested in the limited partnership positions that Blackstone has or um, CalPERS has or the endowments have and the foundations have and, and, uh, and the public plans have. They're interested in grabbing those. And why? Because they benefit in the secondary market. They benefit from transparency. They get to see what's in the portfolio before they buy it. You buy a primary fund, you go into Kleiner Perkins, and you end up getting a blind pool. It's stuff that's going to happen in the future. And typically, the future is between years one to seven. And then there's a five-year investment period. So there's a 12-year time horizon that you're stuck in that fund. With companies staying pro private longer and longer and longer, you're seeing fewer and fewer, fewer and fewer and fewer distributions from these partnerships, right? And you're having to wait longer and longer and longer. And the reason why companies are staying private longer, there's only 105 venture-backed companies that, were fun that went public last year, 105 out of the 7,398 deals that were funded last year, 105 went public. So you're not getting distributions because there's so much money in the private markets, so much money that Uber can go and raise another billion dollars without blinking an eye. Maybe not at $55 billion, but whatever. And so you have this massive amount of, of dollars. $33 billion was raised last year, or $30 billion was raised. $33.7 billion was put to work in the secondary market with $45 billion of overhang. Overhang, dry powder, they're all looking for ways to invest that money in funds that are already vintage years, you know, many vintage years ago. $45 billion. I want to be in that game. I want transparency. I want a faster or closer path to liquidity. I don't want to wait 12 years. I don't want to wait 20 years. If I'm in a public plan, if I'm an endowment, if I'm in a foundation, I've got liabilities on my balance sheet, right? I've got retirees I've got to pay. I've got grants I've got to pay. And with, with 20 years, I can't model that. And so they start selling it in the secondary market to get liquidity. And you're seeing a lot of ha liquidity happen now it's in directs as well. You're seeing Uber and Facebook, you know, not Facebook. Facebook took down a company called Second Market, but that's a whole other story. So, 
what you're seeing is three things. You're seeing the primary markets explode. They're getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but a lot of the plans are reducing and culling the ranks. You've got directs. Directs are staying, the, co the companies that are getting funded are staying lo private longer, which means that there's less and less liquidity for investors. And you've got this massive secondary market coming in. Secondary market is not just limited partnerships, but it's directs as well, and it's structured products that basically circle those limited partnership interests. They, they create access for regular investors to get access to the Ubers and the Airbnbs. So what's going to happen? This is what's going to happen. You're going to see tranches of venture through structured products. You're going to see triple A classes of venture. You're going to see double A and, and uh, single A, and you're going to see just the way the debt is, is structured as well. You're going to see hedge ventures. You're going to see Deutsche, Goldman, RBC. And you're going to see a whole bunch of these companies that are going to put wrappers around this venture stuff, and they're going to say, hey, Joe Smith, we're going to give you access for a half million dollars. We're going to give you access to these top 20 funds and we're going to give you access to these top 20 deals. Here's the fixed portfolio. And for half a million dollars, you're going to get it sprinkled across all of them, and we're going to hedge it for you. We're going to give you 50% of the upside from this point forward, and we're going to give you 90% of the downside, or we're going to give you 20% of the downside. So we're going to pay for the hedge by taking some of the upside. And in, while you buy this stuff, guys, and trust me, I bought my fair share of it, realize they're taking a 14% fee right when they sell it to you. Um, here's what's really interesting. This is really interesting. This is taking um, the whole concept of getting access to the unicorns and the best funded companies by the best venture capitalists with the strongest balance sheets that are closest to liquidity and giving access to those companies. Who wouldn't want access to Box and GitHub and DocuSign and Airbnb and Pinterest. I want access to Pinterest. And in fact, I don't want to pay the current valuation of Pinterest. I think it was recently reported at 20 billion. Uh, Uber, 55 billion. I don't want to pay Uber's $55 billion even if I had it, even if I could buy it. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing these companies formed that are getting discounted access to these companies and they're doing it in the form of a loan to the executives, a loan to the founders, a loan to the early investors, and they're getting equity incentives as part of that. So they're getting, um, they're basically lending you a million, $10 million. There's a $77 million position right now sponsored by one of the early venture capitalists in Pinterest. It's on the market right now. And this fund, for example, is going to take down $7 million of that. That leaves $70 million that's going to be out there in the market looking for a home. So it's really interesting what's happening out there. This is, a, this is what I call access, you know? And looking at the statistics we just went through in terms, of, in terms of the percentage of companies that get funded and the percentage of companies that make up a fund, this is a really interesting way of investing venture capital and becoming a legitimate investor because, you know, what defines success and failure in terms of venture investing? Does it, is, is it where you invest along the curve, early stage, late stage? Is it geography-based? Is it... Uh, you know, where is it that ultimately you are seeing the returns? Because at the end of the day, it all boils down to, am I getting my money back? Am I getting a return on that investment? And what's my internal rate of return? And how is that internal rate of return substitute for other projects that I could be working on? So the big, I'm often asked, what are the biggest risks moving forward? Biggest risks in terms of, um, biggest risks in terms of being an entrepreneur or biggest risks in terms of being an investor? Legions upon legions of craftsmen This is the biggest risk of feeling For you For you For you that's called? It's called murmuration. And you should look it up. You should look up the definition of it. It has to do with trend following or organized chaos or contagion. Those are birds flying in patterns. And what's interesting about that is there's a similarity between the way that we invest in companies and the way that we get caught up in trends. 
and the way that that becomes contagious. We all chase the money. We all expect a positive sloping curve. We all want to or expect you know, equity returns to be 12% and now 10% and now 8%. And what's the premium for that? Right? We all get caught up in that. We all get caught up in these unicorns. I, 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 don't, I can't tell you the amount of time I've heard, times I've heard the word unicorns on CNBC over the last you know, week because of Square. And we're seeing cracks in the system. We're seeing cracks in Venezuela. We're seeing cracks in Puerto Rico. We're seeing cracks in Silicon Valley. We're seeing cracks in New York. And, we're, and it's all relating to, because we're one big society now. We're all intertwined. We're all on technology. We're all buying the same oil. We're all eating the same foods. Um, this is interesting. You know, I, I love this guy, David Hansen. He, he wrote Ruby on Rails, which is a language that I've used for uh, two of my three startups. The, uh, the part of the problem seems to be that nobody these days is content merely by putting a dent in the universe. No, they have to be fucking their own <laughs> universe. Have to, have to f uh, f uh, f what, what, no, they have to fucking own the, own the universe. It's not enough to be the market. They have to dominate it. It's not enough to serve customers. They have to capture them. The term startup has been narrowed and described as a pursuit of total business domination. It turns into an obsession with unicorns and properties of their success. A whole generation of people are working with uh, and for the internet, enthralled by prospects being transformed into mythical creatures. Love this guy because he's like, he started Basecamp like uh, 12 years ago and he's just making money and he's doing a great job and he's, he's clearly a visionary but not a visionary in terms of creating a new market. The startup PR machine is crazy. If you're not VC funded, then you're nobody. It doesn't matter. Your success is measured now in the money that is raised. My biggest problem as an entrepreneur is my job wasn't running a company. My job was getting from financing event to financing event. That was the key performance metrics that I was worried about was how relevant am I going to be to the next round of investors? And how can I keep this game going until we become successful and become self-funding? And self-funding is like mythical these days. You have Square, $135 million deficit every year. They had to go public to be able to fund their deficit, right? And so they had to raise their $250 million, and that's only going to keep them going for two years. So they got two years to figure it out before they're back in the second in this market and raising another $500 million. Funding event to funding event. It's crazy. So leave behinds. Contagion, long-term capital management. If anybody's around, remembers John Merriweather? Well, I worked at Solomon Brothers when John Merriweather was there. It started LTM, it got, had to get bailed out. 2008, the global financial crisis. I don't know about you guys, but it wiped me out. And um, complete liquidity crisis. Today, we have the migrant crisis. We've got a Middle Eastern meltdown, right? We've got some, some of the um, Saudi, you know, Saudi Arabia and other uh, countries that are going to be buried in debt. Um, hyperinflation in Latin America, Puerto Rico debt crisis, Greece, Venezuela, Argentina, China, and Russia. Um, protection. Look for trends, um, and, but don't, don't, don't join the trend. Look for them and either lead them or don't participate. This is one of my rules. Stay fluid and nimble, which means keep your liquidity fresh. Exit often and exit early, and that can mean quitting successfully. Barbell approach. Startups, if you're going to play the startup games, play with a little bit of capital and then invest in the later stage stuff that's closer to liquidity if you can. New approaches to non-traditional investing. Don't listen to Jim Cramer is one of my rules. Um, <laughs> public equity and private equity, they're becoming blended, guys. I mean, the investors in this Series F for Square, and then later they go public and they're still a shareholder. Are they venture investors? Are they private investors? Or are they public investors? And if you need some help, I mean, I think my day job is advising companies, foundations, family offices about all of this stuff and helping them get an excess return. So just to end my presentation, I'm going to ask you guys, remember PATH? PATH was the company that turned down the 125. How much would they have to sell the company for today if they wanted the same 19,600% internal rate of return? that they, got, that they uh, would have gotten had they sold out three months after they started. So this is five years versus three months. This defines that holding period thing. Does anyone, anyone wager to guess anything close to a number? Are we talking maybe they'd have to sell for 10 billion, 100 billion? What about a trillion dollars? 
This is the number that they would have to sell for today to generate the same internal rate of return that they turned down back three months after three months after launch. I don't even know what that number is. I really don't. I think it's a quadrillion. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry that the presentation was uh, not exactly the one that I wanted to give you guys, but I think I, um, I got some points across. Thank you. Yep.